Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Heather and today I'm here to tell you about all the books that I read in February. Now I have a fairly small stack of physical books in front of me, but I did have a couple of ebooks and an audiobook to add to that as well. So overall it was a good reading month, not quite as huge as my January reading month, but still pretty fabulous. So first of all, my two goals for each month is to read one classic and one nonfiction book per month. So for my classic for February, I read The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton, and I really enjoyed this. This is about a young man in the 1870s, 1880s, in New York who is engaged and about to start his life, and he's quite pleased with where he is, until he meets Countess Olenska, who he knew as a child. He was, she was some sort of distant relation, but she moved off to Europe and married, I believe, a Polish count. But she is a source of great embarrassment for the family because she has now separated from her husband and wants to divorce him, but the family thinks that, you know, having separated is scandal enough, why would you want to divorce him? But she introduces a new way of looking at the world and provides a temptation for him that he has never felt before. Much as I didn't really like any of the characters in this, I thought it was a really engaging read. The psychology of everyone was just really perfect, close to Austen, a lot more subtle, but very close in terms of how well it's able to see people and how realistic their actions are. So while I did enjoy this very much, I will be donating this particular copy because as you can see, it is falling apart. So Perhaps I will get a nicer version in the future to hold on to, but I will not be keeping this exact copy, much as I liked it. For my nonfiction book for February, I ended up reading In Defense of Witches by Mona Cholet, which was originally published in 2018. However, it's going to be published on March 8th of this year in English for the first time, now that it has been translated from the French. This is ostensibly a history of witch hunts and their legacies that we are still dealing with in the modern day. And since I live in New England, the legacy of the Salem witch trials has always been very much in the back of everyone's minds, especially throughout middle school and high school. So I was really, really excited to hear about other witch trials, you know, European witch trials that weren't so much focused on during my schooling, as well as the modern repercussions, because I think those are also really important and really fascinating. That's not quite what this book turned out to be. And my main complaint about this book is not so much what it highlighted as how it is marketed and how it went about making its points. So this book, it turns out, is more about modern feminism and how certain points within modern feminism are still treated like a witch hunt. Anyone who champions those points is treated as though they are a witch by non-feminists or otherwise conservative people. So things like not entering into a traditional marriage or deciding not to have children, even down to basic gendered behavior patterns and how they are used against women, whether or not we can help behaving the way we behave, all of which are really fascinating points. However, when a book is advertised as detailing modern witch hunts, and it doesn't necessarily link all of its points back to that thesis and quotes a lot of Gloria Steinem, that's not really what I went into that book for. Lovely though Gloria Steinem is, 
The text is also written in a heavily academic style, which, though important, it doesn't make it the easiest read. And in addition, I should put out the warning that there is an entire chapter dedicated to the medical field and its unfair treatment of women. Other books have been published on this topic, and it is an important topic and a deeply upsetting topic and something that needs to be reformed. However, as someone who luckily has not experienced any sort of medical abuse or procedures against my will or any of the kinds of trauma that are discussed, all that chapter served to do for me was make me terrified to ever go to the doctor again. So overall, while I think this book's premise was really interesting and while a lot of its points are very valid and very important and worthy of discussion, I don't think it was executed in the best way. It doesn't help that it has also lost some of its poignancy in the four years since it was originally published. A lot of its anger and a lot of the fuel for its fire came out of the fight against the Trump administration and the women's marches, which now that we're four years out and facing many other pressing crises, it's lost some of that potency and some of that fire. In terms of other ebooks that I read, the next one was Bloomsbury Girls by Natalie Jenner, who is the author of The Jane Austen Society, which I know people had mixed feelings about. I liked it as a piece of fiction. I thought it really illustrated how reading can bring people together and and how a love of Jane Austen can connect people who otherwise may not have known one another. So Bloomsbury Girls, from the outset, looks to be a completely distinct book, and I think you could read it as a completely separate novel. However, it does feature some characters from the Jane Austen Society, which is really exciting, and it's wonderful to get to see them again, and I think that makes it a little bit more enjoyable if you know those characters from the earlier book. So it follows Evie Stone, who was, as I remember, a fairly minor character in the Jane Austen Society. However, she has now gotten the opportunity to study at Oxford and is finishing her time there, but she is not granted the research opportunities that she wanted to. So she has to find another job, and she finds it in Bloomsbury Books, which is a bookstore in the Bloomsbury neighborhood of London. Bloomsbury is, of course, famous for the Bloomsbury Group, which was full of artists like Virginia Woolf, among others. And so this bookstore is located within that same neighborhood, and it's run by three women and three or four men. And through a series of events, the women begin to band together and begin to change the way the bookstore is being run. And as they are doing that, you also get to meet a number of other wonderful literary and famous figures from the late 1940s, early 1950s, such as Lady Doubleday of the Publishing House, or Daphne du Maurier, and um, who else? Samuel Beckett. There are many other famous faces who I can't remember right now, but it's a wonderful treat when they show up on the page. And overall, I really enjoyed this book as well. I thought it brought up a lot of really interesting points, and it was another fun and cozy celebration of books and reading while also highlighting a lot of really important social points that were going on during this time, such as continued, if not increased, racism and sexism and what those left behind after World War II were left to face what it was like for homosexual couples. There are a lot of really interesting points tucked within 
this very cozy and ultimately uplifting novel. Another ebook I was granted through NetGalley was Ben and Beatrice by Catalina Gamarra. And this is a retelling of Much Ado About Nothing, which is my favorite Shakespeare play of all time. So I was thrilled to see this on offer. This will be published, I believe, in August of this year. And it features several students at Harvard in, I believe, 2017 or 2018. One of whom is Beatrice, who is a queer Latina woman, and her rival, Ben, who is a white, cis, straight male from a very conservative family. Not only are the sparks between them the, a source of contention, but also various socio-political bones of contention come between them a lot of the time. And of course you have the usual subplot of Claudio, the Italian exchange student, and Ben's roommate, and Beatrice's cousin Hero, who are also dating. Now, before I go any further, I must say there are a bunch of warnings that I would like to give about the way that this retelling is delivered. It deals with a lot of mature subject matter. It discusses substance abuse, rehab, suicide attempts, drug use. There is a lot of very explicit sexual content. So I say this not because I have a problem with any of those things or because they weren't dealt with well. On the contrary, they were dealt with extremely well. But I say this A, in case any of those are trigger warnings for you, and B, so that you do not give this to a teenager who is struggling with reading the original play in the hopes that this retelling will make things clearer. This is definitely meant for an older audience. That being said, though, this book was utterly gripping. The stakes for these characters were so high. Everything they dealt with was utterly real and realistic. I was pleased with the way that the Claudio hero plotline was dealt with, except for one minor instance, which I can't really talk about because that would give things away. And the way that it explored not only relationships and a whole bunch of socio-political issues that we are still dealing with, even post-Trump, but also the way that it explored each of the characters' mental health was so fabulous. And I sped through this in about two days. It was really, really wonderful, and I really enjoyed it. And lastly, I finally finished listening to Stephen Fry's Edwardian Secrets. This is a technically a podcast on Audible. However, I think it should be counted as an audiobook since Victorian Secrets was also counted as an audiobook. This is exactly what it sounds like. It's Stephen Fry delving into the aspects of Edwardian life that they would have wanted to keep secret, or at least not have talked about in a public forum. So it again explores items such as murder, their fascination with disguise, sexuality, the experience of people of color, as well as the high immigrant population that Britain received during that time especially the Jewish population fleeing the pogroms of Russia, as well as a variety of social changes, such as the rise of Freudian psychology and Peter Pan. That episode I found particularly fascinating, but just like Victorian Secrets, it was absolutely wonderful and I really, really enjoyed it. In terms of other physical books, I also read The Watchmaker of Filigree Street by Natasha Pulley for Katie of Books and Things Read Along. And also it was a Christmas present from Marissa at Blatantly Bookish. So it was the perfect opportunity for me to read it. And I really enjoyed this. I wasn't sure what to make of it for a really long time. 
but once I hit the halfway point, things started to move fast. And I was hooked from that point forward. This is a book that is very difficult to describe succinctly, but I think the best way to try to do that would be to say that it is about a man who lives a very, I'm gonna say it, very boring life. He works as a telegraph manager for the home office, comes home to his tiny and rather bare apartment, doesn't have any family nearby, until one day he discovers a watch that has been left on his bed that is beautiful and incredibly intricate, and it ends up saving his life. And after that, he goes in search of the watchmaker who made it, who he discovers is a man named Mori, who is a Japanese immigrant. And his clockwork octopus, Katsu, who rolls around his house stealing your socks. And things begin to unfold from there. In addition, there is a student at Oxford who, if not a suffragette, certainly breaks the mold for Victorian femininity. And she is trying to discover ether. And once the two of them meet, the plot really picks up. I can't say too much more about why I enjoyed it, because it would give away major, major plot points, but I did really enjoy it. I don't think it's one of my favorite books of all time, but it was a very, very engaging and enjoyable read, and I really loved it. So if you enjoy Victorian things with a hint of the whimsical, the magically real, and a little bit of the eerie, you will very much like this book. Also, because February started with the Lunar New Year, I finally read The Joy Luck Club by Amy Tan. I had heard wonderful things about Amy Tan my entire life, but I had never actually read any of her work before. So I thought The Joy Luck Club would be the best place to start. And I really enjoyed it, so I am looking forward to reading more of her work in the future. The Joy Luck Club is a group of four women who are all Chinese immigrants to California, and they get together to play Mahjong until eventually, as the novel opens, one of those women has died. And so her daughter is invited to take her place. And so with each chapter, we discover more about each woman at the Mahjong table and these secrets that these mothers have never really told their children. But in addition, we also get to hear things from their children's perspective and things that these girls have never really understood about their mothers. I thought it was really beautifully delivered, although it did get to be slightly difficult to keep track of which mother and which daughter were related and who was speaking at any given time. Ultimately, though, I found it almost didn't matter because the stories themselves were so poignant as to just plain old human experience. And that's what I found truly beautiful about this book. I also read The Secret Adversary by Agatha Christie, which is the first in her Tommy and Tuppence mystery series. This was one of Marissa of Blatantly Bookish's favorite books of last year, and she has been raving to me about it for months. So I was really pleased when I found this very cool looking edition in Kinokuniya when I went to New York City in November. And I have to say, I really enjoyed this book. I haven't actually read any Agatha Christie ever. I have seen many of the television adaptations of Miss Marple and Poirot, but I have never seen or read any of Tommy and Tuppence, so I thought this would be the best place to start. And it was really enjoyable. It's very different from any of her other detective series. Tommy and Tuppence are two friends who are a bit low on cash, and in their attempts to try and hire themselves out to make some money, they end up falling into the biggest piece of espionage that neither one of them could ever have imagined. 
and they now have to try and work their way out of it, not knowing who they can trust along the way. This is the biggest jaunt. It has twists and turns that you will never see coming, and yet it is very, very satisfying and wrapped up quite neatly, which I think is part of the joy of reading an Agatha Christie. So overall, I really enjoyed this one, and I can't wait to read more from Tommy and Tuppence. And finally, to keep in my gothic theme for February that I was trying to hold on to at least, I read The Animals at Lockwood Manor by Jane Healy. This is a book about a young girl named Hetty who has received a few promotions only due to the fact that all of the men who worked at the Museum of Natural History, or at least most of them, have now been conscripted as it is 1939 and World War II is looming quite closely. So Hetty is dispatched with a number of the taxidermied animals from the museum to Lockwood Manor, which is a country estate who has agreed, who has agreed to house this collection to try and protect it from the London bombings. But as soon as Hetty gets there, she knows that something is off. Strange and gothic things start to happen there are nightmares, there are rumors of ghosts, pieces of the collection go missing or start moving. Plus, there's the menacing presence of Lord Lockwood, who is just an utter bore, and his daughter Lucy, who is utterly intriguing to Hetty in more than one way. This I really, really enjoyed. I had been hearing wonderful things about it really since the pandemic, and I've only just gotten around to reading this, but I am very, very glad that I did. I loved the way that everything was resolved. It does get very dark and very bleak, even in its resolution, but I think that's part of the joy of its gothicness. It did ultimately have a pretty happy ending, and one that you were actually sure of. So, I would say this is great for any fans of Du Maurier, but ones who would like something slightly more concrete in terms of an ending. That's my biggest complaint with Daphne Du Maurier, is I'm never entirely sure what she means when she ends a novel. But here you are utterly sure of how things ended. So I would very much recommend this one. Lastly, I have started two books but I don't know if I'm going to continue with either of them. I think this is ultimately just a case of wrong book at the wrong time. So I have been trying to start Perfume by Patrick Suskind, and I am about 40-ish pages in so far. And it's good, but it's not really gripping me the way that I feel like it should, given the description. If you've missed me talking about this before, it is about a young boy in Paris in the 17... I forget exactly when, but pre-revolutionary France, who is orphaned quite quickly, but it's soon discovered that he has no scent. But he has an extraordinary sense of smell, almost superhuman. And this drives him to try to create the ultimate perfume as he grows older, which also leads him to become a serial killer. So given that plot, I feel like I should be more gripped by this than I am right now. I think it's mainly the style of writing. It's very dry. There's almost no dialogue in those 40 pages. And I don't know, it's not just speaking to me right now. So I may put this to one side, I haven't decided yet. And then I also started Daddy Long Legs by Jean Webster. I may keep going with this just because it is so short. And I mainly started this as an antidote to perfume, because I am a major scaredy cat. So my hope was that if I got too freaked out by perfume, I could read a few chapters of this instead. So I may keep going with this into March because I think I could finish it anyway. 
and this is about a young woman who is 18 and can no longer stay at her orphanage and she's not sure what she's going to do until one of its benefactors offers to pay for her college education on the condition that she write him weekly letters, but also that she never find out his true identity. So she begins to write to him under the pseudonym of Daddy Longlegs, and a relationship forms from there. It sounds very cute, very sweet. It's an American classic that I had never heard of until quite recently. So I may keep going with this nonetheless, and it may grip me more when I'm not trying to read it alongside a vastly different book like Perfume. So that is an update on all of the books that I have read up to this point. There is still a day and a half left of February, but quite honestly I don't know how much reading I'm going to get done tomorrow considering I'm returning back to work. So I thought I would give you that update and you have seen what I plan to read in March as well, so I will update you about all of those books at the end of the month. And I have a few hopefully exciting videos planned for in between now and then. Did you read any fantastic books this month that you are desperate to tell me about? Please let me know in the comments down below, and until next time, be safe, be well, and happy reading. Bye everyone.